Good morning. Next Sunday, I'm going to be over on Maui with our students. And the Sunday following, which I believe is March 12th, I will be back here. And we're going to use these two Sundays to take up work of, uh, I don't like to use the term advanced nature, but I have to. <clears throat> But I'll use it in this way, that when we are living purely along the materialistic line of thought and uh, start on a path of this nature, we are, of course, beginners. After the light has begun to dawn, and we begin to perceive a universe beyond this one, something that the Master called my kingdom, which is not of this world, then we may be set to going into a higher state of consciousness. And that's what we mean by advanced, an advanced student or an advanced teaching is merely one that includes those who have reached or have attained some measure of awareness of this other kingdom. There are barriers that we meet as students which act to prevent our spiritual progress and it is these that we must learn about and then overcome in order that we may take progressive footsteps on a spiritual path. The most, or rather the deepest barrier is this one that represents our ignorance of what constitutes an enlightened consciousness what constitutes a means of attaining enlightenment. And this is what I want to talk about at this moment. I would like you to see that as humans, we are living in a mental universe, not physical. The physical is only the outpicturing of the mental. It's really a mental universe. And in that universe, we are governed by two powers, the power of good and the power of evil. And in this universe, as humans, we have no control as to whether or not our live, lives will fall into the lives of good or the lives of evil, the lives of health or the lives of sickness, the lives of accident or the lives of freedom from accident. And yet, there is a definite and a specific way of determining which these shall be. And even if we do not, in this lifetime, accomplish 100% of freedom from the discords of human existence, we do at least avoid 80% of them, and sometimes more. 
And this, as you know, is a worthwhile attainment in and of itself. I would like you to see for a moment how this mental universe affects us without even our awareness of it. And I would like to use for an example a very simple one that showed up in the prints this week. We have on the market many different uh, insect killers. And uh, among these are some that are intended to eliminate mosquitoes. Now, I know that we do not credit the mosquito with a great deal of intelligence. Matter of fact, the only intelligence I give him credit for is that he can find me always. Regardless of where he is or I am, we get together. He has a, a mental antenna that just reaches me. But beyond that, I haven't seen much evidence of intelligence in a mosquito. And yet, we were told in this article this week that every few months the manufacturers of these uh, mosquito remedies have to change their formulas put different chemicals in them because the mosquito builds up an immunity to the drug and doesn't respond to it but the strange thing is this The mosquito is killed dead with that drug. He has no immunity to it, but he provides an immunity for the next generation and the next generation. Think of that. He himself is destroyed with this drug, but the next generation less so and the next generation less so until in six or eight weeks the drug that was able to kill his ancestor of just two months ago no longer is effective on the newborn mosquito that knows nothing about what happened to his great-grandparent. Do you see that there is a mental activity going on? Well, the same thing applies with uh, penicillin. An individual who gets a shot of penicillin today gets a shot that totals more than every individual combined got who received shots in the first year that it was on the market. Why is this? And they tell us that we build up an immunity to it. Who builds up the immunity? Not the person who received the shot they may never receive another one, but all of his neighbors and friends, because he received a shot, his neighbors and friends build up an immunity, and his children and grandchildren build up such an immunity that the doses have to be multiplied and multiplied and multiplied until eventually they'll probably have to do away with that particular drug and find another one. In other words, there is a mental process going on behind the scenes. Now, this mental process is sometimes good and sometimes evil. And we ourselves know nothing about it until it strikes. We may wake up one morning and find ourselves healthier than we ever were in history and wonder why. Or we may find ourselves afflicted in some way with some illness that has come out of the blue and we wonder why. And all of this has to do with this mental operation which is really a universal malpractice. It's not personal not any more than uh, 
the drug to the mosquito or the immunity from the drug is uh, personal. It is only because there is this impersonal, universal mental activity which is sometimes good and sometimes evil. Now, when you come to a study of this nature, you learn that there is a way by means of which you can avoid very nearly all of the effects of this universal pressure, universal mental hypnotism or malpractice. The first step you would learn in the message of the infinite way is that this source of evil, this source of error, is completely impersonal. And therefore, you would never use the words I or he or she when speaking of evil or error because there is no such thing as an evil person. There is no such thing, really, as a person that embodies evil, either in the form of sin or disease or lack. It is all an impersonal activity which operates personally and individually because of our unawareness of its nature. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Don't hurry by that quotation just because you think you've heard it so many times that you know it. You really do not know the significance of that statement. And the chances are that on this earth you never will fully know the depth and meaning of that statement because it really means what it says. That whatever discord, inharmony, whatever erroneous experience touches us, it is because we did not know the truth that makes us free. Now, knowing the truth is an active work. It is not a passive work like reading a book. It is not a passive action like hearing a lecture or a talk or attending a class. Those are the passive aspects of knowing the truth, but they are not the knowing of the truth that makes us free. The knowing of the truth that makes us free is a conscious act of the mind a conscious knowing of specific truth. Now, one of these specific truths that must be consciously known is that evil, error of any name or nature is impersonal. And therefore, whatever in harmony or discord you are associating with yourself or another you must instantly and quickly be alert to realize this is impersonal this is not a person this has its source in an impersonal uh, mental activity or malpractice or hypnotism, whatever term you like, carnal mind. But you have to be sure that you do impersonalize it. For instance, you have all kinds of uh, disease in the world in the form of epidemics, and surely you must know that there is nothing personal about whether a disease hits you or whether it hits your neighbor or whether it hits your child it isn't selecting us because of a fault of our own that theory has long since been discarded when we examine 
the amount of good people there are in the world, seriously good people, religious people, honorable people, people who would have no thought of uh, violating the Ten Commandments, and yet they're subject to the same diseases, the same fears, the same errors as those who we recognize as being humanly in violation of those same Ten Commandments. No, it isn't you who is responsible for your ills except in the degree of your ignorance of truth. When you know this, there rests a responsibility upon you to know the truth consciously constantly until your conscious knowing of the truth has in time become so uh, embodied or has embodied truth within you to such an extent that the knowing of the truth is automatic and no longer a, a thought taking procedure. It is therefore necessary that, first of all, we know what the truth is, then that with every appearance of discord that we utilize the truth that we know, that we bring it to conscious remembrance, you might say application. As you know, we have been working with specific Bible passages, and uh, uh, some of our students and teachers have undertaken classes on this activity. And yesterday in my mail was a letter from the state, from the mainland, uh, to the effect that after the very first class on this quotation work, a student left the class to drive home and found herself in a heavy wind with the car jogging back and forth across the road and other cars doing the same. It took only a few moments for this student to remember the class they had just been in and ask the question, why don't I begin to apply it right here and now? And she did. With the result that within a few moments, she found herself embodied in a peace and the road holding steadfastly to the road, whereas the wind was just the same and the other cars were bobbing around the same as they had been before. Now, this is the fruitage of a principle that I wish to give you now. Truth embodied in consciousness must externalize itself. Truth embodied in consciousness must externalize itself. There cannot be a truth consciously known that does not appear as fruit. For instance, to those ignorant that 12 times 12 is 144, 12 times 12 remains a problem. But only until they become aware of the truth that 12 times 12 is 144, and now it is no longer a problem, but there is an externalized fruitage of that knowledge, and the externalized fruitage is 144, which means harmony. So it is that in the absence of specific truth, the storm will continue to be a storm 
and it will be a problem. But in the presence of consciously known truth, there are no more storms, because storms do not exist as creations of God. God never made a storm. You will remember that Jesus came to do the will of his Father. Well, he stilled storms. Therefore, storms cannot be a part of God's kingdom, or the Master never would have stilled one. Death cannot be a part of God's kingdom, not in our young days and not in our oldest days. Death is just no part of God's kingdom. But death will continue to present itself to us as a problem until we specifically know the truth. And the truth is, Death does not have its rise in God. Death has no source in God, is not an activity of God, does not represent the will of God, or Jesus would not have overcome it. Disease cannot come forth from God. There cannot be a provision in the kingdom of God for anyone, anywhere, at any time, suffering a disease. Otherwise, the Master would not have been doing the Father's will in overcoming disease. So you see that if instead of accepting the universal belief about the inevitability of disease, of accident, of death, of lack, of limitation, of depressions, if instead of that we recognize that all of these have their source in an impersonal mental activity which really has no father, has no principle, has no law, has no divine cause, you at that moment begin to nullify the effect. Let us turn to another subject. What is the most desired thing on earth today? And the answer is peace. World peace. Universal peace. And what seems to be the most difficult thing to attain? Peace. Why? Why? Now mark this well, and you will have the answer. There can be no externalized peace until there is a consciousness of peace. You cannot add peace to human consciousness. You cannot add peace to a warring nature. You cannot add harmony to a discordant state of consciousness. First, there must be the inner attainment of peace, of a will for peace, a desire for peace. You would uh, say offhand that that is the greatest desire today. No, it isn't really. It really isn't. The desire for peace uh, has with it a price. Peace on my terms. Peace the way I outline it. Peace the way this government says it should be, or peace the way that government says it should be. Not just peace. No, no. Peace would mean uh, this. If there were a discord 
a lack of peace in this room among our students knowing that at heart we desire peace the question would arise what is the disturbing element and how shall we adjust it but that is not the attitude of the world. The attitude of the world is to build up armies, navies, and bombs to enforce what it decrees shall be peace. Not laying them aside and saying, come, let us reason together. In our consciousness here in this room, there is peace even if there is occasional strife. Because there is the basic consciousness that desires peace. Therefore, regardless of what problem could come up with us, <coughs> it could be and would be quickly and beautifully adjusted without anyone walking into the room with revolvers. So it is. Before peace can come to the world, there must first of all be a consciousness of peace within. <clears throat> this consciousness of peace <clears throat> is attained in the same way that you attain a consciousness of health or prosperity. Do not think for a moment that you can attain health or prosperity without first attaining the inner consciousness of these. You cannot add to a vessel already full of something else. You just cannot add to. There must be a transition within. How do we attain a consciousness of health, of harmony, of safety, of security, and of prosperity. First of all, by consciously knowing the truth that these are the will of God. Not only that these are the will of God, these are the will of God for mankind. And remember, that means all nations, all races, all religions. There is no such thing as a favorite race or a favorite religion or a favorite color or a favorite creed there is no such thing you cannot understand the nature of God until you understand the universal nature of God be assured that I was thrilled that Dr. Tillich this famous theologian in his lecture a few weeks ago brought to light that the Spirit of God does not function solely in Christianity, nor does it function solely through the Church, but that it functions universally wherever a consciousness opens itself to it. And it functions outside of the Church as well as inside. That is as close to declaring the infinite way principle of the universal nature of God as can be expected. Now, until you understand that life has no race or religion or nationality, that life is not restricted, you cannot know the nature of God. Therefore, you are not knowing the truth that makes you free. We speak of brotherhood of man, there never can be a brotherhood of man until it is acknowledged that we are to call no man on earth our father, for one is our father which is in heaven. In other words, we have only one creator and it is the same creator whether we are white or black whether we are Oriental or Occidental, whether we are Jew or Greek. And until this is recognized and acknowledged, 
we have no consciousness of peace. Ah, but the moment you consciously acknowledge there is but one Father and we on earth are brethren, all of one household, you have already established peace within your consciousness and so far as you are concerned, war and the effects of war begin to end. A thousand may still fall at your left and ten thousand may fall at your right. It will not come nigh your dwelling place if you have consciously accepted God as the Father of all and therefore have consciously accepted that we be brethren. And remember this, when we have accepted that, we don't ask whether a person or a nation deserves our help or our good. We know in advance they do by virtue of relationship. Just as we know that because I and the Father are one and all the Father hath is mine that I deserve the good of God in spite of my human failings. So do I know then that you by virtue of your relationship with God are heir, joint heir to health, harmony, safety, security, peace on earth, prosperity, all good. But I could not know this truth about you unless I am willing to accept that this is a universal truth. And therefore, we are brethren, brethren, we are brothers and sisters to our enemy nations as well as our friendly nations and then find that thereby enmity has dropped from our consciousness. Ah yes, enmity must drop from your consciousness before you can come into peace. Enmity must drop from the world consciousness before the world can come into peace. You individually may find your peace on earth. That will not prevent the thousand falling at your left and the ten thousand at your right. It may be that through your realization that you are a branch of the tree that is one with the tree, that you bear fruit richly, but this will not prevent the person in ignorance of this who is thereby living as a branch cut off from the tree and that is withering, it will not prevent him withering. So you see that <clears throat> what determines the sanctity, the security of your life isn't what is taking place out here in the world. It is what is taking place within your own consciousness. Now, in our work in the infinite way, certain principles have been revealed that are not generally accepted in the world. But our acceptance of them has produced tremendous fruitage in our experience and one of these is the one power. Universally, mankind accepts two powers, the power of good and the power of evil, just as it accepts material power, mental power and spiritual power. But truth reveals that only that which emanates from God is real, true. Therefore, only that which emanates from God is power. 
Now then, if there is such a thing as law at all, it must be of God, and therefore it must be spiritual, and it must be the only power. Ah, but yes, we as humans are suffering from the belief in two powers, so is all mankind. Therefore, if you and I would be free, and through our freedom ultimately give the world its freedom, from these discords, it becomes necessary to consciously know, abide, live, dwell in the truth. There is but one power, and that is spiritual. There is but one law, and that is spiritual. I am standing fast in the truth of one law, one life, one power, one mind, that which emanates from God. As we consciously abide, consciously, consciously, consciously abide in that truth, you will gradually witness how this uh, claim of two powers recedes from your experience and less and less of it appears to disturb you. But no one can do this for you. The Master Christ Jesus could reveal it when he says, what did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk. In other words, there is no power in your disease. It can be revealed in Scripture and it can be retaught in this age. And to some extent, it can even be demonstrated for you by those who are a step ahead of you on the path. But that would only be from one ill to another ill. The actual freedom from the belief in two powers or two laws can only be brought about by you. You are the one who must consciously know the truth. You are the one who must abide in this word and let this word abide in you. Now you know that we are functioning 24 hours a day, awake or asleep. And you already know that this mental miasma is taking place, this mental malpractice. You already know that there are people well this morning who will be sick tonight. There are people alive today who won't be tomorrow, to human sense. And you know the reason for it. You know that they are not responsible for it. You know that it is only that there is this mental activity going on, operating in their consciousness to bring about these conditions. And you know one thing now more than they do you know that it can be prevented. And you know that you are the one who can prevent it. And you know the way you can do it is by knowing the truth that makes you free. In the same way, every one of us is faced with problems absolutely beyond our capacity to meet. There isn't anyone on the face of the globe don't think that the President of the United States is alone in having problems that are unsolvable. You have them. They come to my desk every single day of the week. Problems for which there are no human answers. And if we were limited to my understanding or my powers, God help me and God help you, and God help the world. But we are not limited. We have capacities beyond the human. We have the mind of God to draw upon. We have the will of God to draw upon, the power of God, and the law of God. How do we do this? Through our humility. Through a conscious act of humility, and that is realizing 
that within me and without me, closer to me than breathing, as low down as hell and as high up as heaven, wherever I go, there is a spirit, the spirit of God. And if I open my consciousness to it, it will enlighten me. It will heal me. It will protect me. It will save me. He performeth that which is given me to do. He provides his wisdom is infinite. All of this is of no avail except in proportion as I consciously make those truths live in me so that instead of my mind being acted upon by these unseen mental forces subliminal perception forces, I consciously am the captain of my own ship and the master of my own fate in proportion as I realize the kingdom of God is within me and this power is universal, spiritual, available to all men everywhere. There are those out now, this minute, lost in the desert. There are some out in the sea somewhere, not able to make their way back to shore. But our conscious remembrance of this provides them with the necessary guidance to reach safety and security. We have not only a responsibility for our personal lives, but Our studies enable us, first of all, to prove this truth in our individual experience. However, once I have proven, even in a measure, that there is a presence within me to enlighten, to strengthen, to guide, govern, direct, protect, and by my conscious awareness of this, have in a measure demonstrated it, I am now called upon to take the next step. And that is to realize how universal this truth is. That everywhere this same spirit pervades, penetrates human consciousness, and uh, it is available now. This spirit that dwelleth in me is now available to any person lost on the desert or at sea or up in the air or beneath the sea. Wherever I am, God is, and this spirit within me is present where you are. Whether you are in Russia or China or India or whether you are on the desert or at sea or in the air, where I am, thou art. And I am here and I am there and I am everywhere. This spirit of God that indwells me is not personal and it does not indwell me as if it were finitized or channelized in me, this indwelling spirit is universal. And even though in my first infant steps in truth, I may know this truth about myself, I will quickly find that I lose it. Unless I begin to perceive its universal nature and begin to apply it so that men and women and children everywhere on the face of the globe and even those who have passed beyond our sight may in their reaching out for even though they know not what they may discover this spirit present within them to guide them to their particular home safety security and 
The question most frequently asked in my mail has to do with the subject of prayer. And I may say to you that it is the most difficult question to answer because I have already discovered that I cannot write a book on that subject. It has so many connotations that it can only be written in little bits and then has to appear in articles and books here, there, and the other place and the student gradually acquires a consciousness of it. The reason is that prayer, which is the word of God, cannot be localized. There is no way to place it between the covers of a book. Now, whereas in our infant days we are knowing the truth or praying, for ourselves, we must quickly outgrow that. There is no way to channel God's good to you or to me. There is no way to make God function for you or for me. That has been the fault of prayer throughout the centuries, that it is always a prayer to do something for me or for mine, even going as far sometimes as being a prayer for my nation or even for my allies. And you see, this is one of the greatest barriers to prayer there is. It profiteth you nothing to pray for yourself or for your friends. And all such prayer is profitless. If prayer can be summed up at all, it would have to be summed up in this, that prayer is an awareness of the universal nature of God. Prayer is an awareness of the universal nature of good. Prayer is an understanding of the universal nature of life. In other words, the moment I would try to know that your life is eternal, I'd be blocking out God from this world. I can only know that your life is eternal by virtue of knowing that God is universal life and therefore it must be your life. But if I haven't taken that first step to know that God is life, I have choked off the value of prayer by saying God is your life. That certainly would indicate that it may not be the life of the man in prison or the man in the hospital. How foolish such prayer would be. Prayer is an acknowledgement of God. Prayer is an awareness of the nature of God. But God is universal. There is neither Greek nor Jew. There is neither bond nor free as far as God is concerned. The Declaration of Independence is true when it says all men are created equal. They are in the image and likeness of God. They don't remain equal in human experience. But they are equal in uh, their original creation in that God is just as much the life of the slave as of the free. What makes him a slave? He doesn't know this truth. What makes anyone a victim of limitation, physical, mental, moral, or financial? They do not know the truth. The moment we can forget self and realize the universal nature of God, of law, the universal nature of spirit, of power, we will stop trying to channelize it and try to make it work over here for this person or over here for this group. Oh no. To know the truth means to set yourself free from personalities. God? Do I believe in God at all? Of course I do. 
Of course I do. I'd have to be spiritually deaf, dumb, and blind not to know that God is. Am I stupid enough to believe that God is functioning for me or for my benefit? I hope not. I hope I know that God is universal being, your being as well as mine, the being of my enemy as well as the being of my friend. I hope I know that God is spiritual power, but not only for students of the infinite way, God is spiritual power, and that's that. And then as my thought rests on those who are not infinite way students, I am praying for them in the moment that I am realizing the same principle, the same law, the same power that I have found functioning in my life and in the life of our students, this is your life in the hospitals, in the enemy countries, in the prisons. There is but one God. And that God is closer to you than breathing. Not only you true students, God is closer to you. I told you many times about the mistake the Hebrews made in believing that Jesus was speaking only to them, that only they were children of God, that only they had God power. And the mistake that was perpetuated until Paul came along to reveal that the words spoken by the Master were not meant only for Hebrews. They were universal truths. And every truth about which you read, every truth you study in the infinite way, please be sure that you do not make the mistake of believing that these apply only and operate only in the infinite way. They operate wherever they are known. Ye shall know the truth. And those of you who know the truth can make them operate for those who do not yet know the truth, but only in a limited way until they themselves awaken. The Master asks, Do you believe that I can do this? And I have to ask many times in my mail, do you want just this healing or are you seeking spiritual awareness? Because until a person makes up their mind, they will not make too much progress on this path. What makes this then a lesson for the advanced student, this. It has been imparted to you and you have accepted that in the human picture there is a universal mesmerism producing good and evil in human experience. And it has been imparted to you that you have the capacity to nullify eventually all, but for the time being most of these laws, are negative laws, that operate in human experience, and that the way to it is consciously knowing the truth, consciously knowing specific truth. And that for 24 hours a day you are functioning even when you're asleep <clears throat> and awake or asleep you are either receptive and responsive to these mental subliminal forces or you have removed yourself from them you have made yourself come apart and be separate and have subjected yourself to the activity of divine grace that works from within you. <coughs> you have consciously denied that the laws of this world operate in my kingdom. And you have acknowledged 
that you are subject only unto my kingdom, the kingdom of God which is within you, and that you recognize this as universal life, universal law, universal being, available to all those who open themselves to something greater than human power. It makes no difference if they are opening themselves to a paganistic god. It makes no difference if they're opening themselves to a Hebrew god or a Catholic god. The point is, are they opening themselves to something beyond human? Because if they are, they're opening themselves to the same God that we have. There is no such thing as a Hebrew God or Jewish God, there are, or a Catholic God or Protestant God. There are merely those concepts of God. But the God itself is one. And so anyone reaching out beyond the confines of human help is really reaching out to the omnipresence that I am. Now, after this, we're going to meditate again and see what is given to us. God is not in the whirlwind, but in the still small voice. And in applying that, remember that every problem that presents itself to you is the whirlwind, the storm. And uh, the power isn't out there in it. The power is within you. And so, as you remember throughout the day, God is not in the whirlwind. God is in the still, small voice. This will make you stop for a second as if you were listening for that voice. It only takes one second to establish that contact. Just the remembrance. God is not in the whirlwind. God is in the still, small voice. and then go on. And the solution to the problem will come from within. You may not know how it's solved or why. The presence goes before you to make the crooked places straight. Don't give thought to how the problem is to be solved outside of the natural human steps you're taking. But remember, God is not in the whirlwind. God is not out there in the problem, in the storm. God is in the still small voice and then let it solve your problems. 